My name is Taryn Hart and I'm with Occupy Missoula and I blog at plutocracyfiles.com. Okay. Uh, my name is Ryan Devereaux. I'm a reporter with the TV radio news program Democracy Now! I've been covering Occupy Wall Street since uh, shortly before it started on September 17th. Uh, I've also been writing about the, uh, about the pro protests for Al Jazeera, uh, New America Media, and I will have an article in The Guardian coming out at the beginning of this week. Great. Uh, and we'll make sure to link um, those articles for you. Um, so you said you got involved just before September 17th, so just before day one? Right. Yeah, we um, we went down. We being Democracy Now, uh, cameraman and I filmed an action that they uh, that some of the organizers did on Wall Street uh, a couple days before the occupation started. They did uh, actually yoga in uh, right at the corner of or right in front of the Federal Building, twenty six Federal, right by the New York Stock Exchange. It was a really small number of people. It w wasn't anything like what they've uh, what they're doing now, but. Um, and probably no real hint that they would become this from that. Oh, absolutely not. There was no, no way to tell it was going to get as big as it did. And then we also uh, sat in on a meeting the day before the occupation started where they were just going through, um, you know, uh, legal rights, how to deal with the police and that sort of thing. With a, it was a small number of people, maybe two or three dozen people attending the meeting. I had no idea that this was going to turn out to be, you know, what it did. There was no way. I don't think, uh, you know, speaking to organizers uh, who've been there since the beginning, no one really expected it to turn out the way that it did. Right. Yeah, yeah. I think um, David Graeber just wrote a piece saying, you know, they kind of gotten used to not having these things go anywhere, having protested for years and years. Um, so, okay. And so then in on the first day, though, there was a fairly decent turnout, is my understanding. Were you there for that? Yeah, I was. Um, if I remember right, it was a couple, uh, like a couple thousand people that showed up in the financial district, um, right down near the iconic bull statue. Um, and, and at that point, uh, the organizers were handing were handing out flyers with about seven locations. Well, with with seven locations that they were hoping to, uh, that were potential options uh, for occupation. I think their original uh, plan was to occupy Chase Manhattan Plaza, but the NYPD set up a bunch of barricades there, making that impossible. So the crowd marched um, from from the financial district area where the bull is, down by Wall Street itself, a few blocks north of Broadway to uh, Zuccotti Park, where they've been ever since. Um, and I, you know, I don't get the impression that anyone really realized how fortuitous that decision was, given the uh, you know, private public uh, ownership of, of that space. It's really kind of worked out in their favor. So yeah, they went there. They um, some announcements were made, and they stayed the night. And I guess the rest is history, so to speak. Right. Yeah. I mean, how many people stayed that first night? Was there a hundred or less than a hundred? Uh, from what from what I understand, it was over a hundred. I think it was near two hundred, but I could be wrong there. I didn't stay the first night. I stayed late, but I didn't sleep over. But it was a good num good number of people for uh, something that was just starting out. Right, if, if right. They didn't have any of the infrastructure stuff there that they have now. You know, now it's like a little village. But right, yeah. right, right. Um, yeah, I heard about it. I think in August. And I remember hearing that first day and just hearing that they weren't able to get onto Wall Street and feeling kind of like, oh, well, that might be it. But of course, as you mentioned, Zuccotti Park has turned out to be a great location for them. Yeah. So, okay. And so then when did, when do you think, what were the big moments in terms of it taking off? Well, um, I think I think there are a few different sort of milestones. For me, um, one that kind of gets glossed over that I think was actually uh, very significant was uh, it was the day after Troy Davis was executed. I, I, I want to say that was, uh, you know, don't quote me on this, but I, I think it was September 22nd. Um, and I think uh, Troy Davis was executed on the 21st. Of course, he's the he was the death row prisoner in Georgia. Um, whose guilt had been seriously called into question by former director of the FBI and, you know, um, even 
people who are pro death penalty really thought that his case looked very, very suspicious. There was a huge outcry um, across the country, across the world, you know, to stop his execution. Uh, he was executed that Wednesday night. I believe it was a Wednesday night. The next day, there was a, a, a rally held at Union Square, which is, um, you know, in Manhattan, not not too far from Zuccotti Park, but a ways up there. Um, and it was a lot of people who were, you know, anti-death penalty folks or people who were just appalled by the way the Troy Davis case played out. That rally turned into an impromptu march through lower Manhattan, um, which is sort of a uh, foreshadowed the way a lot of these marches have gone since uh, these Occupy Wall Street marches because, you know, there was this, there was no plan, there were no permits. People started chanting off the sidewalk into the streets and they took to the streets and, you know, just started marching through, uh, marching through lower Manhattan south. Um, the NYPD was scrambling to respond. I don't think they anticipated this. Um, the, the numbers climbed up near a thousand marching through the street. Um, at one point in Lower Manhattan, they tried the NYPD tried to stop the march. There was a bit of a scuffle between, uh, you know, the, the NYPD got pretty rough. Uh, cameraman that I was working with that day uh, from Democracy Now got uh, hit w with a baton in the face. Luckily, we, he didn't get he didn't get hit too bad, but it was it was pretty uh pretty rough. And that was the first time I I saw the NYPD really crack down. Uh, but it didn't deter the marchers. They continued on um, and decided to go to Zuccotti Park or Liberty Park, as the protesters call it. And there they met up with the Occupy Wall Street folks. And it was a, it was a pretty incredible scene when they arrived there. And together, the two groups sort of, you, you really couldn't, it's kind of hard to distinguish who was who, who was there for the Troy Davis thing, who was there for the Occupy Wall Street thing. But they all marched together to Wall Street itself that night. Um, really large number of people and as far as I can remember that that was the first large nighttime march on Wall Street I could be wrong about that but um down there in front of the federal building that I mentioned earlier right across from the Morgan building in this historic space on Wall Street itself the police uh they, they took one young woman and drug her over a barricade yanked her over a barricade threw her on the ground her head hit a curb another officer picked her up and threw her back over this was a five foot tall 100 pound girl who was there taking photos they, there were a handful of really heavy handed arrests that night and this was all in plain view this was all, you know everyone watched this happen and I think that that night um, really emboldened a lot of people, um, Occupy Wall Street folks and Troy Davis folks, and they sort of saw them saw each other as allies. And uh, you know, it it sort of changed the demographic at Zuccotti Park. You saw a little bit more diversity. You saw some of those Troy Davis supporters start returning to the park. You saw the numbers start to grow. Um, then that weekend, that following weekend was the weekend where there were the eighty some arrests and the pepper spraying which had the same sort of effect, um, you know, drew a ton of attention, galvanized folks, um, pulled numbers in. And, uh, you know, so... Uh, and isn't the, that the, right when Michael Moore showed up the first time? Um, I... Right with that pepper spray incident, you know, within a day. Yeah, Michael Moore was there right around that time, but I don't, I don't remember him being there the day of the pepper spray incident. Um, but he was there right around that time, that's, right. that's for sure. And, uh, the, I mean, the pepper spray day was huge, obviously. Those, not, those videos went viral pretty quickly. And, you know, this is something I've talked about a few, you know, before when I've talked about this Occupy Wall Street stuff is that, um, sorry, there's a cat on this desk. <laughs> um, so I, for a lot, of these, uh, a lot of these protesters, a lot of the people, the Occupy Wall Street supporters here in New York, you do have veteran activists out there, but you also have a lot of people who've never done anything like this before, and also people who have come from backgrounds and cities and communities where they've never seen the police maybe abuse their power or get rough with people, and you know, seeing that kind of thing for the first time or actually physically experiencing it for the first time um, can be really jarring, but it doesn't seem to have turned off a lot of the protesters. It's actually helped them. It's actually helped the movement um, sort of recruit people, I guess. Um, that would be, they're not outwardly trying to, but the videos kind of do it themselves. Um, so after that weekend, after those 80 people were arrested, after the young women were pepper sprayed while they were corralled behind the uh, kettle netting, I mean, you, you saw more and more attention. Then one week, one week later, um, exactly one week to the day, was the big Brooklyn Bridge 
arrests. And I was, I was there on the bridge as everyone was corralled and, and kettled and arrested. Um, and that was really one of the most memorable moments of this last month or so. Um, sort of the uh, feeling when everyone took the bridge and, you know, took the roadway of the bridge, not the pedestrian walkway and started making their way across in these huge numbers. It was, you know, the, the feeling was absolute. The feeling of the protesters seemed to be absolute jubilation. They were really excited to be on there. And I, it, there definitely was a sense among many that they thought they, thought they were going to get to the other side of the bridge. Um, and then, you know, less than a week after that, there were the arrests at the intersection of Wall Street and uh, Wall Street and Broadway, which was the night uh, following the, the huge, the massive um, union back march. That was, a, that was a Wednesday, like I said. Um, tens of thousands of people marching that day peacefully throughout lower Manhattan. And then the, when, when everyone arrived back to Zuccotti Park after that large march, uh, a, a good number of folks decided to march on Wall Street, try to march on Wall Street again. That was blocked. That was when the police pepper sprayed the crowd and uh, this, a number of officers entered the crowd with their batons and were swinging pretty uh, indiscriminately at everyone, including journalists, two Fox News, uh, uh, Fox News crew. Two guys were uh, pepper both One was pepper sprayed, one was hit with a club. Um, again, it, was the same, it created the same sort of dynamic, more attention, um, more viral videos and more criticism of the NYPD. Um, and then, um, so it's, really, it's just been this, 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 this pattern. Um, then we had last weekend with Times Square, which uh, to be fair, the NYPD, I, you know, I observed them really, really seemed like they were making an effort throughout the day to make the, the, the process, the whole thing cooperative. And, and they, they seemed to do a pretty good job throughout most of the day. Things did get, um, Seemed to get out of hand though. Once the crowd arrived to Times Square and uh, the the intersection where I was at, they they brought the horses in into the crowd, which really outraged and terrified a lot of people. Um, yeah. Yeah. It just to back up to a few of these things. Um, one is I watched the Brooklyn Bridge incident on live feed, um, <laughs> and was following several people, including you, on Twitter, and. It really made me realize, I mean, it really was intense to watch it that way. It made me realize how much we've really circumvented the media. They've been able to circumvent the media, mm -hmm. you know, in the, in the sense that, I mean, we were all watching it as it was happening. It was incredibly intense. I remember, uh, you know, I remember, you know, I mean, 700 people were arrested and when the kettling was happening and, you know, you could really sense all of that through the live feed and by watching the Twitter things happening. Another thing that you mentioned um, is that a lot of, maybe even most of the big incidents that have happened have been spontaneous marches. And I think um, Nathan Schneider just wrote something kind of discussing uh, the fact that you have the ability, this this kind of um, very loose organization where people have the ability to act spontaneously, the police don't know how to deal with that. They have a very hierarchical structure. They're used to things being very planned and it's really kind of working against them, I guess, you know, mm -hmm. they're ending up doing things that are building the movement. <laughs> right. I mean, would you agree? Absolutely. I, I'm really glad that you brought up Nathan's article because I, I was going to bring it up myself. And it's, it's an excellent piece. And for anyone who hasn't read it yet, they should. It's uh, at wagingnonviolence.org. It's about diversity of tactics. And Nathan has actually been just incredible on covering this story. He was covering it long before it was anything and probably knows as much as anyone, uh, probably most, more than most. Um, and it, it, what he touches on in that piece is really significant and really interesting. And it's the... In, it is, as you said, it's the way that these protests that are not permitted. The, 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 the big union-backed march that Wednesday, the unions, um, as I understand it, um, acquired permits. But when the Occupy Wall Street folks march, they don't, they don't get permits and they don't seek the permission of the authorities. And, you know, I've, I've spoken to senior detectives who've been on the Occupy Wall Street beat since the beginning. And they've expressed, you know, it's a, it's a very frustrating thing for them because they don't feel like there are any leaders that they can speak to. 
they don't feel like there's any way that they can know what's going to happen. Um, it's really difficult for them to plan accordingly. And, you know, to some extent, I understand that their mandate is to protect the public and maintain order and, uh, you know, uphold the constitutional rights, not just of the protesters involved in this thing, but of the, of the people, you know, living in the area and, and New Yorkers at large. So I can understand how this is a, a difficult thing for the NYPD to respond to. Um, and it's, a re it's created this very fascinating dynamic that Nathan talks about where it's, um, you know, where the Occupy Wall Street folks do stuff that keeps the city guessing. And the way he sort of frames it is that in Seattle, during the, during the so-called Battle for Seattle protests, the anti-globalization movement stuff, I mean, this was, this was a really, uh, it was effective to a degree, like it kept, it kept, the, uh, kept the city guessing and, you know, these sort of diffuse acts all over the place that aren't, re that are, you know, sort of connected, but sort of not created a sense where they where they were the protesters were actually disrupting the status quo which is, ostensibly is what this whole thing is about um, so yeah I mean it is totally it totally is what they have been doing to, to the large degree I mean it's not like all of the protests were totally out of the blue like the march on the Brooklyn Bridge it was pretty clear that there was going to be a march on the Brooklyn Bridge that day but it it wasn't clear that it was going to take to the road. And that was the decision that I can, I, I witnessed, I witnessed that decision sort of being made at the base of the bridge. So it's, it's stuff like that. It's, I don't, it's very interesting. You never really know what you're going to see here. Right. Or the decision to breach the barricades on wall street. Right. Also which, a which... spontaneous decision where they got consensus at the moment mm -hmm. and made the decision to do it. And, you and um, Penny Red, I think, did the m most amazing Twitter coverage of that night. I remember uh, hearing about the woman who was arrested when asked her name, who said Troy Davis, that, that very dramatic moment. I heard that from you on Twitter and then saw it the next day on Democracy Now! It was incredibly um, dramatic. It, yeah, it was. Uh, I, mean, I may get the order wrong here, but it was Troy Davis, Emmett Till, Medgar Evers, Martin Luther King. She never said her. This, it, you know, it, for those who did, didn't aren't aware of this moment, this young woman was. Um, this was after the arrests began at Wall Street on Broadway the night of the uh, big union-backed march. This young. We need names for these nights, but. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Right. But um, she was being led in cuffs to an uh, unmarked police car at, you know, by the NYPD. When asked what she was doing, she said she was standing on a sidewalk. Um, you know, when asked what her name was, she responded, as I said, you know, Troy Davis, Emmett Till, Edgar Evers, Martin Luther King. And it just, I mean, for everyone that was watching that, it was, a, it was you, you couldn't believe that she responded that way. And um, it's, it's interesting the way that this... Uh, this movement has incorporated these other issues. Like it's not just, it's not just about um, the financial system necessarily. It's not just about the the banks um, down there on Wall Street. You know, you have uh, Oscar Grant Plaza, I believe is what it's called in Oakland at the o Occupy Oakland. You have a Troy Davis Park in Georgia. Um, and just on, on Friday, I attended a march um, where Cornel West was arrested along with another uh, number of other, you know, prominent civil rights leaders that were protesting with Occupy Wall Street support, um, stop, stop and, NYPD stop and frisk policies here in New York City, which have really, um, which have been exceedingly controversial um, in the city, uh, it, given their impact on low income communities and communities of color. So it's like this movement is... Um, the way that um, a New York politician described to me is sort of matured really, really quickly um, to to incorporate different struggles, um, not just economic justice issues, but now uh, civil rights issues as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I tend to think about the 99%, 1% dichotomy as not just about economic issues, but also about uh you know, not just being left out economically, but being left out politically, that the mm -hmm. 99, that, you know, a feeling that the government, it has been taken over by the 1%. And that manifests itself in a million ways, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, 
uh, and to back up a little bit again and talk a little bit more about Nathan's article, which was great, and I will link, and I'll also make sure to link the Democracy Now! video of the woman that we're discussing, because you guys did get great video of that. Um, you know, he all, you know, one of the things he said, which I really appreciated, is that, you know, as somebody who is experienced protester, he has a blog called Waging Nonviolence, that he felt like they should be more organized, that they should do things more in line with previous, you know, the with the civil, you know, they should have more organized protests and more organized civil disobedience. But really, and, and many of us felt that way. I mean, I've, and you hear that, I think, a lot that that's people's initial reaction, that they, they need to be more organized. They need to, and, and in fact, the kind of, loose structure has been really a strength um, in ways that many of us didn't understand or anticipate and that we're just coming to see. Um, mm -hmm. That's certainly been my experience and I appreciated that that was Nathan's take on it as well. Um, and I thought that that article was incredibly smart in terms of explaining why the NYPD um, seem so baffled. You know, one thing I wanted to comment on is everybody I've talked to that's been in New York emphasizes how militarized Wall Street is, you know, the kind of green zone aspect of Wall Street. And that's not something that really translates, I don't think, to the over video or maybe people haven't filmed it enough. I don't know. But it's not something that I feel like translates to the extent that I hear from people who are there, the people who are there mm -hmm. really comment on the militarization and the extent to which, uh, to on the police presence, the extent to which Wall Street is militarized. I mean, my understanding is that now you have to show ID to go onto Wall Street at all. Is that correct? Um. I don't think that you have to show ID at all times. I could be wrong about that. Um, I will, was on Wall Street itself a few nights ago, um, and I didn't have to show any ID, but those, these things change quickly. Um, and you, there, there definitely are times when they do request ID. Basically, the way that the area looks right now is that there are these metal barricades, they're like three and a half foot tall barricades that the NYPD puts up everywhere. Um, all over the place in the financial district, particularly around Wall Street itself. Um, to give you an idea, uh, the, the major intersection at, on Wall Street where the Federal Building, the Morgan Building, and the Stock Exchange all sit normally has anywhere between 30 to 50,000 people walking through that intersection on a daily basis. That number has been severely, severely, severely cut down because you can't even walk in the actual street itself. Um, I mean, when, when I went to that uh, demonstration before the occupation started, that was the yoga demonstration um, right in that intersection. I mean, they were in the middle of the intersection because everyone walks in the middle, middle of the intersection normally when there isn't Occupy Wall Street going on. So it's totally changed the way that foot traffic in that area um, is seen. And, you know, in terms of uh, the militarization, there will be times when it won't really seem that bad, um, like at Liberty Square, where there, you know, there, there isn't, there's always a presence of uh, about a dozen or more police cars on one side of the, of the park, always parked there. You know, some unmarked and most marked. They have this, uh, this, this Cyclops Tower, as they call it, um, as protesters call it, which is like this big monitoring tower that looks down over the park that they, that they set up, that the NYPD set up there right at the beginning of the occupation. Um, then some nights it really is a militarized presence. Sometimes it seems almost inexplicable when they'll bring out, you know, dozens upon dozens upon dozens of police officers with their flex cuffs attached to their, uh, attached to their pants. And, you know, sometimes they'll have their billy clubs out, um, you know, and the, the whole idea of it being a green zone, I think, is a really uh, interesting and pretty accurate way to describe this because the, the conflict incidents that we've seen over the last month uh, with respect to Occupy Wall Street have occurred when Occupy Wall Street leaves its little 
its little protected space and at Zuccotti Park or Liberty Park or whatever you choose to call it. Um, so it's when they go out that things get sometimes turn ugly. It's it's a, it's sometimes you feel like it's a very liberated space, and then other times you feel like it's a totally encaged space. It's a it's a weird sort of feeling. Right. Um, yeah. So, what has been your feeling on the uh, demands issue? On demands. Um, well, it's it's hard because. I mean, it's hard for me to say whether or not they should or shouldn't be issuing demands because I'm just I'm trying to stay objective about this sort of thing. But I think that it's been interesting um, to see the way that the media has responded to the lack of demands. It's really uh, thrown the mainstream media for a loop. Uh, there just isn't the the normal sort of situation that you have with a protest where you go in and you talk to the leader and you ask them what they want. They tell you what you want. Then you report what the leader said that the movement wants. Um, that's obviously not the case with Occupy Wall Street. This is a different, this is, the order is flipped. This is, you know, bring the people together and talk about what you think is wrong and then start talking about ways you could address what, what is wrong and then start talking about ways that you can articulate what you have found is wrong and then, you know, maybe start moving in the direction of solutions. It's, it's not something that fits well into, you know, um, a two minute news clip or anything like that. So, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know if we'll see any concrete demands anytime soon. I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they issue them this afternoon or I wouldn't be surprised if we never see them, you know, it's, it, with this thing, it's it's hard to predict um, where it's going to go, and it's hard to really know what's what's best for it. I, I think it's I think the smartest thing to do is just sort of watch it grow, see what happens. Right. Um, what do you see this uh, as connected in any way to what happened in Wisconsin? Do you think it's the same impetus? Um, I think that, I think that there are similar elements here. I think it's, it's a feeling of, um, disenfranchisement and frustration, um, among a significant portion of the American public, uh, a sort of feeling that there is something deeply, deeply flawed in the way, um, in, in the way power is sort of concentrated in this country. And I think that, that, you know, that manifested itself in Wisconsin in some incredibly huge protests. And I think it is that it's that same sense here that's driving people to, to come out and support this occupation. I don't think it, I don't, cat, sorry. <laughs> I, I, I don't think that they, these things are unrelated at all. I think that there is just an enormous sense of frustration in the American public right now. And I think it cuts across all sorts of socioeconomic um, positions and ethnicities and, you know, people just aren't happy with the way things are right now. Right. Yeah, I would agree. And, and in terms of, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly. There's a couple of different ways to see Wisconsin. When I interviewed Kevin Gustala, he thought that Wisconsin had moved into electoral politics too quickly, that that was kind of, the lesson of Wisconsin. Would you agree with that? I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert on how everything went down in Wisconsin, but that definitely seems to be um, an accurate description of, of what happened. And I think that there's a real fear among a lot of supporters of Occupy Wall Street that this could go down that road as well. I am you know, uh, some media reports like to suggest that this thing is already or is on its way to being co-opted by the Democratic Party, but I don't think that that's going to happen so easily if it happens at all. Um, there's a lot of resistance in the movement to uh, to being affiliated with any you know political group. So can it can it go down the way Wisconsin went down? It's possible, but there there is resistance to any sort of political co-opting. Right. Yeah, that's I mean, that's what I'm hearing is definitely a lot of concern coming from within the movement about co-option, um, especially to the Democratic Party, but also to groups like Move On who are viewed as being 
maybe co-opted themselves, I suppose. That would be what they would see. They don't want to go the way that they, I think, believe move on has gone, which is to be co-opted by the Democratic Party. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, And, you know, one issue I've been hearing a lot. um, Do you see this movement as related to the Tea Party as that's an issue I think I've heard people taking different positions on? Um, I would say that it's related insofar as the Tea Party as a group of um, seems to be um, in some measure a, a group of people that are frustrated with the status quo and have chosen to um, you know, act out publicly and to express those grievances. That's about as far, maybe, as I, as I would uh, venture to uh, sort of compare the two. I mean, you know, you, can, you, can, you could talk all day about the differences between the Tea Party and Occupy Wall Street. Um, you know, the Occupy Wall Street's relation, the backers of Occupy Wall Street versus the backers of the Tea Party. You know, the, um, it's, 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 it's not the same thing. Then again, I, I should say you see like a number, uh, you know, there are definitely libertarians and, uh, you know, Ron Paul supporters, people that may uh, normally be associated with the Tea Party movement down there at Occupy Wall Street. So I think that there's something that about what Occupy Wall Street is all about that resonates with people who could potentially also be swayed by, by the Tea Party's rhetoric. So there, there is some sort of, you know, overlap there, but I'm not a Tea Party expert, and I, I kind of defer to people who are, and they don't seem to uh, think that there's a lot of uh, similarities between the two. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, it's just something that you will hear occasionally. I mean, I think that the people, that most of the people who were involved with the Tea Party are not, um, don't look favorably upon this movement. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, and that would be my take as well. Although there is somewhat that libertarian um, element as well that I've noticed. Yeah. Um, where where do you see where do you see this movement going? I mean, one of the things that's been discussed is or is starting to be discussed, which is probably speaks to its success, is how this movement is going to scale. Um, you know, how it's going to actually turn into uh, go from just being an occupation of the park to some kind of political change. Um, Where do you see it going? I mean, obviously no one knows at this point, but... Well, I can really only speak with any semblance of authority to the situation here in New York City and the occupation here. And I think the occupation here and what it will eventually end up doing turns mostly on what happens on the day-to-day. Um, there are a number of challenges facing Occupy Wall Street here in New York City. For example, Zuccotti Park is small, and Zuccotti Park is full of people. And it, you know, you talk to a lot of organizers there, and they feel really confined by the space and feel like they've done about as, as much with it as they can. There are security issues there. There are people who have problems with things being stolen. Um, You know, you have a lot of people staying there who, you know, you might be staying down there at Zuccotti Park, but you don't get to choose all the people that you're staying with. So they have to sort of navigate these challenges of dealing with people who otherwise wouldn't be living in such, you know, close proximity to each other. So it presents this sort of microcosm of a community where you you have to, you know, deal with your problems. Where they try to deal with their problems on their own, you know, without um, getting the authorities too involved. Um, so managing that space alone is a huge problem. Holding on to that space is a huge problem. Mayor Bloomberg recently said that he's planning to take a harder line with Occupy Wall Street in New York City. So we'll see how that plays out and what exactly he means by that. I know he I, he said something about. Uh, more permits. Yeah, he, I think he would like to see more permits, and the NYPD would like to see more permits, um, or any permits, I should say, um, when they march. I don't, I don't foresee the movement um, wanting to start getting permits, so that there could be a potential for conflict there. 
I, I don't think Brookfield Properties is keen on allowing the protesters to stay there much longer. Um, so we'll see what sort of moves they make to try to push them out of the park. I, I, from what I understand, um, they are trying to look at legal ways in which they could remove the protesters. Um, then there's the, there's the issue of seasons. It's getting cold in New York, and it's going to get really cold very soon. And it's not you don't want to sleep outside in New York City when it's freezing cold. Right, and they don't um, have shelter. They're not allowed right. to have shelter, right? They're, yeah, they're not supposed to build structures or anything like that. Um, so there's going to be the issue of how they're going to survive the winter. Um, these very real, like on the ground, basic issues are going to are going to I feel uh, play a major role in where this movement goes because what started in New York City has become so symbolic. So if it fails, it, it I think it would really be a blow to the movement. Um, so they have to find a way to, to keep going. And in addition to that, they have to find a way to keep the, the press interested, I think, uh, unfortunately, because w- without any attention, without anybody knowing what's going on here, it's hard to imagine that it would uh, affect any change, any real sort of uh, change nationwide. And, you know, in order to hold the mainstream media's attention, you have to be pretty provocative. And unfortunately, the thing that that what it took to get the mainstream media's attention in the beginning of this movement was police violence and young women being pepper sprayed and hundreds and hundreds of people being arrested, you know, together on the Brooklyn Bridge. It, it, I, it would be, I think, sad if that's, if it only, if those are the only things that can keep people interested because those situations are terrifying for people and people get hurt and, um, you know, you know, we'll see. We'll we'll see if Occupy Wall Street can can find creative ways to keep people informed that also are safe, um, that don't involve people getting hurt. Um, you know, it's I, I don't like to make predictions about this because um, I I did that early on and I was all wrong every step of the way. Um, so you know, you gotta you gotta kind of just have to wait and see what's going to happen. But I think maybe um, start. I, well, I mean, it's hard to say what their intent is since they are so reticent to, to talk about what they collectively want. But um, in the beginning, the idea was to allow this to, you know, the way it was laid out was that this would last for a few months. Um, and a few months would be, well, you know, from September maybe into November, early December. Um, I don't know if there's a, how long they they plan on doing this for um well we'll just have to see i think that the, there's a potential that they you could start seeing some efforts to move inside um an indoor occupation somewhere in new york city is um something that i think may be in the works in the very near future um i think that uh it, you know it, it we'll, we'll see what they i i Covering this thing for the last month, I've, I've realized that they are. This is a creative group of people, with a you know they have a lot of ideas and they have the capacity to surprise you. So they they might find a way to stick around for a while. Right, right. So yeah, I mean, there's the immediate issues in terms of how long the, the physical occupation itself is going to last, and then obviously whether it's going to be something beyond this physical occupation and how it transitions from, you know, and I, and I don't know, I mean, one of the things I think people don't realize that I have a little bit of experience with, um, because we have an occupation here, is that when you are involved with an occupation, you're very involved with the day-to-day needs of the occupation, right? I mean, it's a, it says a lot about our assumptions that people would expect for the occupation to have demands. I mean, in the beginning, you're very concerned with just feeding everybody and shelter and kind of dealing with those immediate needs. And and to think that it would come with demands assumes that there would have been some kind of top-down structure that existed that set this up that 
that it came with ready-made demands, which it didn't. The idea is to come together so that you can discuss these things. But first right. to establish an occupation and then start to discuss these things. But when you are involved with, but being involved with the occupation itself does take a lot of energy just to, and, per, and particularly in New York, where they can't have structures, where their con, their occupation is constantly being challenged right now, which it was really strange. I mean, it felt like Mayor Bloomberg said, you know, they can stay indefinitely and then started kind of, you know, with one thing after another and trying to shut it down. <laughs> right. I mean, since then, I mean, I think he said you can stay indefinitely and then within, I don't even know how long, very, very quickly, the cleaning issue happened, right? It was within a few days. Yeah. It was like three days or so um, after he said that you can stay indefinitely that he then came to, he actually came to Zuccotti Park, you know, walked through the park pretty quickly and then, you know, announced that they were, they were going to get cleaned and people were going to be sort of displaced and that sort of thing. So it's been a, the, the message from the mayor's office on Occupy Wall Street has been pretty all over the map. Um, hard to really uh, pin down exactly what they, what they want because it, it seems to change fairly regularly. And, I mean, I think that part of what people are trying to understand and come to terms with is, is occupation as a strategy, that that's a new – it's not a completely new strategy, but it's pretty new to this country anyway. Um, mm -hmm. And trying to understand, you know, and one of the things I've heard people talk about, you know, and, and, I, and I think that you are starting to hear about this from people who are very sympathetic, if not involved, in terms of how do you scale is, you know, you'll hear this a bit from Naomi Klein, you know, saying that Seattle had all of this energy but then really fizzled because it was unable to organize in a way that it sustained itself. And she really mm -hmm. came and made kind of an impassioned plea that that not happen here, that they find a way to um, build organizational structures that are durable, that have some ability to last through some adversity. Um, I don't know whether there's a move to do that. Are you aware of whether there's a move to do that in New York? A move to to build sustainable structures, like uh, it's a sustainable organizations, to look beyond this immediate occupation into something more durable. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a major concern that's aired at general assemblies again and again. Um, to the extent that they're having that they're making progress on building those structures, it's it's difficult to say. I, I know that there are, there are a lot of people who are really frustrated with. Um, how things are going in terms of organization within the movement, in terms of making decisions. Uh, frustration. There's a lot of frustration with the way that the GA, the General Assembly, um, is conducted. And I think that they are, is, they are looking for other options. Um, spokes, spokes councils, for example. Um, other ways in which the, the decision-making process could potentially be streamlined. Um, and I, you know, there's a good chance that they will, they will come to some sort of conclusion um, soon because I, I feel like the occupation here is really at a, it's at a critical point right now. And there are a lot of people who've been there quite a while for many weeks who I think may, f you know, who, it's weird to say veteran when someone's been, you know, doing something for a few weeks, but they, it's sort of the role that they have filled in, in, you know, with respect to the other people who are involved. And then you have new people coming in. There are, you know, different people wanting to uh, approach things in different ways. I think maybe some people feel like, hey, I've been here for a while. I know what's going on. And their, their egos do clash. Um, there's the issue of burnout. You know, how are you going to, you know, these are people sleeping out in a park, you know, on cement in New York, and it's getting cold. Um, keeping people injured, like physically there on a regular basis is a real challenge. Um, so it's like, it's like you said, people don't realize how much goes into just keeping the occupation going, let alone, you know, building structures like foundational internal structures that will allow this to continue as a process and a movement. Um, and of course the very idea of having something organized is at odds with a lot of the philosophy of, horizontalism 
Um, right. And I mean, Naomi Klein, when she spoke specifically said, I don't think they're at odds, but I think that there are people who believe they are that. Mm -hmm. So that's a challenge in whether you can maintain a kind of philosophy of horizontalism and maintain and build something that has some durability. No, I think I think that that's that, that is the challenge really in this uh, in this movement proceeding, um, and we'll see if they can we'll see if they can pull it off. Uh, I, like I said, I don't I don't make uh, predictions about this thing anymore, but they've exceeded my expectations like consistently um, in terms of creativity and durability. And you know, I think people may underestimate. I I, I think people do underestimate how committed a lot of these uh, a lot of the protesters here are. I you know I've spoken to so many of them covering this for the, the past few weeks. People have just these incredible stories about why they came out here and really think that this is the real deal, a real shot at changing things. And, you know, people who have, who have quit their jobs to become a part of this or people who can't find jobs and feel like this has to be it, this has to be the movement that, that creates some basis for real economic justice and change in the United States in terms of, um, you know, inequality and the distribution of wealth, um, you know, the, the role of people in sort of directing the way that this democracy goes. People really think that this is the opportunity to, to secure those kind of changes. And they're really willing to put their, put their bodies on the line to risk arrest, to be, arrest, to be arrested willingly for, for this. I think that's significant. Um, so I don't think people should underestimate how committed the, the protesters are or how creative they are. We'll see what Right. Yeah, I have, and and the I have heard I somebody linked me to a couple of things talking about this whole spokes council idea, and that that's a major challenge right now. That they've grown to a point where people are a bit frustrated, maybe with the general assembly process, and feel like in order to be, you know, so they're they're having to balance that horizontalism with. A desire to be more efficient. Um, what's your sense of how that's going? Is it? It's pretty contentious. It sounds like. Right. I, I. From what I understand, and I wasn't there. I believe at the last general assembly, this was a major issue. Um, that was. Uh, it was tabled, I think, at the last general assembly, and I think there are plans to sort of uh, revise the proposal and bring it back up again. I, you know, I've attended offsite meetings where. Um, this has been a major issue. We're talking about the Spokes Council and how it could fit into the decision-making process here. Um, the, the, where that has been the central issue of the meeting. Um, I think there are a lot of people, a lot of of those veteran sort of um, organizers who I mentioned who think that that might be the route to go. Um, you know, it's like I said earlier, you have a lot of people who have been doing this activism stuff for a long time here with a lot of people who have never done it before. So explaining how a spokes council works and why it um, why it could be uh, beneficial it takes time. Um, I think a lot of people are hoping to see quicker results out of this. And I mean, if they're going to try to achieve the if the protesters are going to try to achieve the things that they seem to want to achieve, I mean, this is going this is a huge undertaking. So I think people should realize that quick changes aren't aren't going to be uh, aren't going to be coming. So. Right. Uh, so how about you? Are you going to continue to cover it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I feel like uh, I, I can't not be covering this right now. It's just so fascinating. And it's in the city that I live in. And I think it's just really, really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So you're going to continue. Democracy Now! is obviously absolutely. given some of the best coverage um, from the earliest dates have had, uh, you know, continually good coverage of it and democracy now is committed to continuing coverage of it oh yeah well we will definitely stay on top of this and i i will stay on top of this as well um and you know there's been a lot of criticism and a lot of justified criticism of the media's coverage of of, of this um occupation this movement but i i want to say that there have been a number of independent journalists who've been really out there just doing amazing work covering this you mentioned kevin from fire dog lake um Kevin's been great traveling all over the country covering this sort of co covering this movement. Um, Lori Penny that you mentioned from the UK has offered you know her experience uh, covering protests 
on the other side of the ocean, um, sort of putting them in con putting this in, in that context. Uh, Mike Tracy, a colleague of mine, has been covering this for a reason. The nation has been doing great stuff covering the NYPD. Justin Elliott at Salon. Um, uh, Lucy uh, at um, RT at Russia Today has been doing a phenomenal job. Allison Kilkenny and at The Nation and in these times has been doing great. There's just, I mean, I could go on and on. Um, you know, Jay Meyerson, a bunch of people have been doing really great work. Josh Harkinson with Mother Jones. Um, so I don't think that the media has totally dropped the ball in this. I think a lot of people have really, really put everything that they can into covering this as fully as possible. So I'll be along with those folks with that good company trying to, you know, keep this, stay on top of this story. Very good. Is there anything else you want to say in conclusion? Anything we haven't covered? Um, I, I think, I think that about wraps it up. I, I mean, just stay, just keep following a uh, democracy now. And, yeah. And hopefully we all continue to be, um, surprised by this movement and what it's been able to accomplish. Yeah, I think that the uh, precedent is there. The precedent is there. They, they will probably continue to surprise us. That, that's as close as I will get to a uh, prediction. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. I know you have a cold. I hope you get better soon. <laughs> and um, please, I, I will put the links um, that you mentioned and make sure to send me any links that you think might be of interest to our viewers. Okay, we'll do. Okay, thank you so All much. Right. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.